Thank you, Jim. This morning we're in Mark chapter 2 as we consider a case for forgiveness this morning. Uh, It's a very important uh, part of the ministry of our Lord as he begins the early stages of ministry on the earth. And I draw your attention again to Mark chapter 2. I'm going to ask if you would please take your Bibles and open them up to Mark chapter 2 so that we can read together several verses of Scripture here uh, that we want to point out. This morning, if you'd stand with me, please, as we read God's Word, and so we stand in honor to God's Word this morning. Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they moved the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, "'Son, your sins are forgiven.'" But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Father, we thank you for the word of God this morning. And Lord, it's a blessing for us to come and to consider this great passage of scripture. What an event it must have been. Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, as we understand the meaning of this passage today, and help us, Father, as we apply it to our lives personally. May you truly be glorified in all things today, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Please be seated. If we back up and we look at Mark chapter 1 and we look at some of the events that took place, remember last Sunday, if you were here, uh, we were talking about a day in the life of Jesus and we were examining what that day really looked like and we see that uh, after he calls Andrew, Peter, James, and John to himself and they leave their fishing nets and they come and they follow him, uh, they ended up in Capernaum, which is a very prosperous and populated town on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee. And while he is there, he goes into Peter's home and he meets Peter's mother-in-law who's suffering from the fever and he heals her immediately. And that was pretty exciting and the word began to travel and it traveled very quickly. While he is teaching in the synagogue following that, there is a tremendous day because he's there in Capernaum, it's the Sabbath day. And he goes into that synagogue and he preaches like no one's ever heard before. He's teaching at a different level. He is authoritative because he is the author of the Bible. What a day that must have been. And someone in the crowd as he's teaching there recognized him. It was a man who was demon possessed and it wasn't that the man recognized him but rather the demon recognized him. And so he called out to Jesus, and he wondered what was going on. Was this the time of judgment? Had judgment finally come to the demonic realm? And Jesus responds in casting out the demon from inside this man. Well, then word spreads even further. By the time evening falls, there is a crowd at the door. Sabbath is over at sunset, and the people have come, and they are seeking to be healed And as they're coming, Jesus is healing them, and we don't know how long that went, but eventually Jesus got some time to sleep. He gets up in the morning early, before anyone else, it's still dark, and he goes and he spends a quiet time alone with God the Father in prayer. And then things creep right back up to that tempo that he's been experiencing. I mean, things are going crazy again, and as things are going crazy again, Uh, we find that uh, there are crowds now who have gathered. The fame is building, and this is pretty amazing uh, as we look at what is happening here. Now, if you stop and you look at that first day, what we see is that Jesus, by doing these miracles, is authenticating 
himself as the messenger sent from God, and by authenticating himself as the messenger sent by God, he is also authenticating the message. Why should I listen to you, Jesus, would be ringing through the minds of the people who are hearing him. And is it true, Jesus, that you have come so that you might heal the sick? Is it true that you've come so that you cast out demons? Or is this what you're seeking to do? Remember, the prophets in the minds of the Jews were thought to have healing powers in the past. But what Jesus introduces here in chapter 2 is the real motivation for him coming to this earth. For Jesus has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we're introduced now to this whole component of faith and forgiveness. Remember that man, since the time way back in Genesis chapter 3, has been at enmity with God. It's been a relationship that has really been broken by sin, man's fateful choice, and Adam then passing down that sin nature to every single male ever born. Jesus being the lone exception because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So we all are under this weight of sin, and when Jesus comes to the earth, he finds that there are a few who are faithful. There were people that were holding out hope that Messiah would come in their lifetime. You know the story. They're godly people because they're people of faith. They still needed to have certain sacrificial things done in order to have their sin covered. Remember, Jesus alone is the only one who can take away the sins of the world. So man found himself with a tremendous need. Yes, there were a few godly people who were trusting in God, people of true faith, but there were many, many more who were religious and just going through the motions. Maybe you're here today, and that describes you. Maybe that describes you this morning. You've been going through the motions. You're not sure about your future. You're not sure about your eternal destination. You're not sure about your walk with the Lord at all. My friends, this is exactly why Jesus came. And this is exactly why he preached the message that he preached. You see, the heart of the problem here is sin. Pick this up with me here in verse 1. Jesus has come back to Capernaum. This would be kind of the hub where he would minister. It's been several days, and it was heard that he had come back to home, and that home base. Was it Peter's home? I don't know. The Bible doesn't disclose that. But the Bible does tell us that many were gathered together so that there was no longer room. So we have this pressing situation. We've got a situation where, where all of these people are jammed in this house, and they're trying to get in front of Jesus so that they might have the opportunity to have some healing take place. And Jesus isn't just doing the miracles of healing. Jesus is also teaching them. He's preaching the message of repentance and faith. So while he's doing this, we find that there are some interesting things that happen. We know that something occurs which was really, really strange. You notice that in your passage of Scripture, there is a man who's paralyzed. He's not able to walk on his own. His legs are all in atrophy. He doesn't even have any muscle mass there anymore. But the good thing for him is he's got four friends. Aren't you thankful for friends? How about friends like that? He's got four friends who are so concerned about him physically that they're willing to carry him on a stretcher to come see Jesus who may be able to heal them. But in their mind, it's not a question of may be able to, but absolutely will heal him. And so they get to the house with great expectations. There's no doubt that they're pretty excited about what they're hearing, about all these miracles that Jesus is doing. So even though it's a case of, of tremendous, tremendous difficulty, we're talking a man who is paralyzed, they are not afraid to bring that paralyzed person to Jesus because they know the power that is being displayed by the healing of Jesus the Christ. 
That's a pretty exceptional time, isn't it? I've been to a faith healer meeting or two over the years. I remember going to one back in the 1980s. Always wanted to see what was it all about. I went into this big auditorium and they asked if anybody had an ailment uh, to come forward and they'd be able to heal them. And uh, I was watching this and I gotta admit, I'm a little skeptical, you know what I'm saying? And uh, the biggest healing event that took place that night, other than the amazing offering that they received, and that's a whole other story, uh, and that's really why it happened, uh, but there was a man, and he came up, and uh, they said, this man has a physical problem. And uh, I'm thinking, I, I, he looks fine to me. But he said, no, he said, uh, this man has a problem. One leg is longer than the other leg. Now, he's standing there just like me in front of you. Now, here's the amazing thing. You know, if you're sitting there in your chair, put your legs out in front of you. Just put your legs out in front of you. Are, about, are they about the same length? Crook your hip a little bit and make one longer and one shorter. <laughs> How would you be able to really tell the difference? You know what I'm saying? I'm sitting there watching this fella, and they proclaimed him healed by some great miracle of God. And I thought to myself, he walked up there, and he's walking back. And, and I, I hung around afterwards because there were people who came up there in wheelchairs and they stood there. They looked fine, but I, I was, again, very skeptical and they allegedly healed them. I was looking afterwards out back to see if they left in those, you know, uh, wheelchairs again. You, you see, the interesting thing here, this is a very different miracle in Mark chapter 2. This man comes in and he is paralyzed and you know that if you've had a broken leg or broken arm, what happens after your muscles don't use that for a long period of time, even a short period of time, considering six weeks or so? The, the muscle tends to go all limp, doesn't it? I remember I had a broken arm, had a cast on it, uh, and it was... Uh, kind of a mess, you know, and, and they finally cut it off. And I remember looking at my withered arm, and it was, it, it stunk. Oh, man, do you ever have that cast come off? I mean, they, they're all sweaty, and they're gross forever, and all the skin is all peeled off. It was just nasty looking. I couldn't wait to get home and get in the shower and clean that thing off. But it was only about half the size of my other arm. So again, I'm building this up because this is a tremendous miracle. These men come, they've got four of them carrying this man, and they get to the home, and they realize that they can't get in the door. And so because they can't get in the doorway, they're very concerned, but they're also very creative. These are the kind of guys you want to hire to work in your company, all right? They come up with some great ideas. They're thinking to themselves, okay, we can't get in there. Uh, they couldn't even look through the door probably and even see Jesus, but they could hear him and they knew where he was seated. And so they began to go up on top of the roof. Now, all of these homes were flat roofed and they had stairways on the outside that you could access the roof by. And when you got up to the top, you had timbers that went across and then laying across the timbers would be brush and whatever, depending on how wealthy you were. A, a thatch roof was very typical in that time. And then they would lay down some type of tiles over top of that. But you could, in the evening, for instance, go up there and relax if it was hot. You might not want to stay inside the home. It was kind of your place to, to go and chill out. So they take this man up these stairs, and they get to the very top. They peel back the tiles, and they start peeling back the thatch. And they create a hole in the roof. And with the hole in the roof, they're able then to lower him down. So here are these four men, and they are totally committed to getting this paralytic in front of Jesus the Christ. And this is something that is absolutely driving them to do this. Now, it must have been amazing because as Jesus is teaching and as Jesus is healing, all of a sudden you have this, this opening in the roof. And somebody probably looked up and said, oh, there's stars out tonight, <laughs> you know. And, and here comes this man. And the man comes down, and the reaction of Jesus is very interesting. And we have to look at this very carefully because, once again, Jesus is going to speak to him and say, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, that is a very gentle, compassionate response to this man who's coming down through the roof. And can I just point out, that that wouldn't be everyone's response. Most of the people there would be highly annoyed for a couple of different reasons. Envision yourself there, right? There is Jesus, he's teaching, he's in a crowded room, he's, he's giving the word of God, telling exactly why he came. 
and all of a sudden the roof starts to open up and you don't dig through a thatched roof without stuff falling, you know what I mean? And so stuff is gonna fall and it's, it's gonna start coming down and it's gonna be pretty annoying. Uh, and you're there to hear what he has to say, and all of a sudden, you know, he's getting interrupted. I, I don't know if I'd appreciate that. Are you with me? Are you starting to get annoyed? You know, I'm just a little annoyed. And here's the thing that really annoys me, is it's a man who's coming down who's paralyzed. Now, remember this, that the thought process was that if you were ill, you were affirmed, uh, you were in some way uh, struck with a malady, it was due to What? Y'all got it. Remember Jesus? Remember the disciples came to Jesus and they saw the man who was born blind? They said, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? If you're Jesus, you don't like those two options because there was a third option. And Jesus said, neither one of those people have sinned, parents or this man. This man is going through this affliction so that he might be able to be a tool of God's because God was going to use him to glorify himself. Isn't that amazing? The mindset, however, at this time, when this man is being lowered down, was that, oh, good grief. I mean, seriously. I mean, you're going to lower this man down? I'm getting all this stuff on me. Do you, you know, now I'm going to itch. You know what I mean? That thatch is kind of itchy. And here's this man. He's, he's committed some kind of sin. Who knows what he's done? And mercy me, but he's going to come down here and interrupt our meeting. I mean, to tell you what, you, you'd have some ushers getting rid of that fellow if you could just grab him, you know? And, and I want you to, to, to just fill out the rest of this, this scenario. As Jesus is teaching, he's got a whole bunch of people there in front of him. And some of the people are scribes from Jerusalem. And do you want to take a guess where the scribes are going to sit if they were invited to a house or if they came even on their own? Where do you think they would sit? Right in the front. Because everybody revered the scribes. And so they're going to sit in the front. The Bible says specifically that when this man is lowered down, where is he lowered to? Right in front of Jesus. He is, do you get the irony here? He is literally coming down through this hole right on top of the scribes. I mean, maybe they even had to get up and move. And they're all decked out in their robes and their fancy vestments. And here's all the stuff coming down from the ceiling. And they're getting itchy too. And they're thinking to themselves, good grief, why is this man coming down here? This man has definitely sinned. There is a problem with him. And why would he come and interrupt this meeting? Now that you have the scenario in play, I want you to consider the words. Because the sin... It's obviously a huge problem. And it's at the heart of the problem here as we look at it. And we find that the heart of the problem being sin and forgiveness really is at the root of the scribe's problem. Notice here that as they came, bringing to him a paralytic, he was carried by four men, verse 3. And being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. The word forgiven literally means to send or to drive away. Our sins are as far as the east is from the west. There is absolutely, once they're forgiven, no more condemnation. And the Bible is very clear about that. You can check out Psalm 103 and read down through that chapter in verse 12. But Jesus looked and he saw this man's faith and he ordered full forgiveness. Now a careful read, those of you who are here on Wednesday night for the uh, Grasping God's Word, a careful reading here tells us that there were four men who lower him down in front of the crowd. And then Jesus is going to tell them that their faith is what the difference truly is all about. Jesus saw not only the man's faith, but Jesus also saw their faith. And so as he sees their faith, verse 5, and Jesus seeing their faith, plural, said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And so what Jesus sees is not only this man who is being lowered down, and he sees his faith, but he also sees 
more than just his faith. He sees the faith of the others uh, who were willing to take him up onto the roof and, and tear a hole in the roof. And as Jesus is doing this, remember, Jesus has been preaching uh, Jesus was there, and the Bible says he was speaking the word to him. Go back to verse 2. Do you see that there? What was Jesus' message? Well, verse 14 of chapter 1 in Mark says that Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This was what Jesus is speaking to them when he says there that he's speaking the word to them. Specifically, he's preaching the need for repentance and faith in the gospel, the good news of Christ. We find here that Jesus then is going to see their faith. At what point does their faith uh, develop? At what point did they come and say, you know, Jesus is God and we're going to place our faith in him? The Bible doesn't say, but the Bible recognizes that there is real, genuine faith there. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. That's Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. What Jesus looked at here was a man who had a need, and he realized that the need that he had was not merely physical. Jesus is looking here, and he recognizes this man's greatest need as that which is spiritual. All of us have a spiritual need. We come into this world as sinners. Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we live in a sin-cursed world, and we, we have problems. The paralytic had problems. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't walk. He couldn't make a living. He was no doubt poverty-stricken because of that. He had to depend on others. He was totally helpless. And he comes to Jesus, and he puts his faith in Jesus because his greatest need, even though his, his most obvious need to us would be his physical need, his greatest need was... He needed a forgiveness of sin. His heart needed to be changed. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Ever think about what is in really spoken about when it talks about gaining the whole world? Have you ever thought about that? What's it mean to gain the whole world? Well, it could mean different things to different people, couldn't it? I'm sure Attila the Hun had an idea of what gaining the whole world would be, or Alexander the Great. Uh, but maybe for you, you're thinking to yourself, well, if I could just have health, if I could just have wealth, if I could just have some of these things, that would be gaining the world. God's word says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet still loses his own what? His soul. You see, a very temporal aspect of my life is what you see here. I, I am only six decades old here, but the reality is I've got a lot of life to live. You know what I'm talking about? And I am not talking about life here. It is far greater the events that are going to transpire in the future. You and I are created with a spirit that will live forever. Our soul will go on and on and on throughout eternity in one of two places. And if you think of Christianity... And you think of some of the byproducts of Christianity. There's a lot of very, very positive things that are associated with uh, our faith in Christ. There are benefits. Our love for others, our high standards of morality, our sense of purpose, satisfaction in life. All of these virtues are byproducts of biblical Christianity. But only Christianity provides a solution for humanity's fundamental and far-reaching problem. Namely, the reality that sinners stand guilty before a holy God. He has justly condemned us to eternal hell because of our rebellion and our lawlessness. Without a doubt, God is not only a God who is just and holy, but a God who is merciful. And this is the whole purpose for bringing Jesus to this world. So that Jesus and Jesus alone would forgive the sins of sinners like you and me. Every single one of us stands in a great time of spiritual need. Our sins need to be forgiven. And the only way possible for us to have forgiveness of sin is by faith in Jesus Christ. How amazing it was that day. When the leaders came and they looked at the heart of the issue and they realized that, you know, 
there's a huge problem here. What Jesus has claimed is uniquely alone, something that God should be able to claim. When they heard Jesus' words that, son, your sins are forgiven, uh, the scribes who were there were reasoning in their hearts. Now stop and think about it. The scribes had a responsibility. The scribes' jobs uh, basically were to maintain orthodoxy. So if someone came along who would promote something that was a little outside the box, it was their job to enforce uh, the law and for enforce their standards. They were the heavies. They're the they're the they're the Gestapo. They're the, the whatever you know. I mean, they're the they're the guys there that are going to carry the big stick. And so when they hear Jesus say, "Your sins are forgiven," they go right through the roof. There were three types of blasphemy. Three levels of blasphemy. One, if you spoke evil of God's law, you were committing blasphemy. Uh, they alleged this of Stephen, they alleged it of Paul, both over in the book of Acts. A more serious type of blasphemy was if you spoke evil of God directly. That happens over in Exodus chapter 20 with the cursings and so forth. Um, and that brought about the death penalty, that second level of blasphemy. The third most serious level of blasphemy was when a human being claimed, get this, claimed to possess divine authority and equality with God. For a person to act like they were God was the greatest offense of all. In John chapter 5 and verse 18, Jesus was calling himself God and, and making himself equal with God, the Bible says. This was the charge against him. The charge that leads to Jesus' crucifixion is over there in John chapter 19 and verse 7 uh, when they cried out, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, we have a law, and by that law he ought to, to, to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. And so they seem to have a legitimate complaint, don't they? The only problem was Jesus is God. You see, that's the whole point. There is only one who can forgive sins, and that is God. They had that right. Isn't that great? Let's give them a round of applause. This is wonderful. They got a, they got a theological point correct. But where they miss it is when they looked at Jesus, they did not acknowledge him as God. And Jesus then goes on to show his deity as he follows this up, the accusations of blasphemy. Notice, Jesus says to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? How did he know that? Notice here, just prior to that, immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning? And then he asked this key question. And the key question was huge. The key question, we don't want to miss this. What's easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? Uh, they're looking at Jesus and they're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're cre you're, you are claiming to be God because only God can forgive sin. And that's blasphemous. And because of that claim, you should be put to death. And Jesus is going to challenge him. He's just going to ask him a simple question. What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, which requires absolutely no proof, or say to this paralytic who has absolutely no muscle mass in his legs, who's been totally helpless for a long period of time, rise up. And not only rise up, but rise up and walk. Rise up and walk. Maybe it would have been possible if his friends helped him, he could possibly stand. Are you with me there? But there is no way he is going to be able to walk with legs that are this big around. How would that even be possible? If you've been injured in some way and you've had surgery, you know that terrible word that they use, therapy, right? You're going to need PT. Whoa! run. Okay. It's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. It's going to take months for you to get back. You know, you have hip replacement. You got knee replacement. You got head replacement. You got every kind of replacement. And then they all fix you up. And then you go to therapy. Ooh. Jesus says, listen, there's no therapy here. 
you're going to be healed. Absolutely. I want you to rise up. And, and by the way, we got a crowd here. Could you pick your bed up too? So could you roll that thing up and then could you just cart it out of here? <laughs> He'd seen the man's faith. And because of that, Jesus would say to do exactly that. Rise up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Now, it puts it on a level that we have in the Old Testament with Elijah, doesn't it? You remember when Elijah was calling down fire from heaven? Remember when all the prophets of Baal are running around, they're cutting themselves and trying to, you know, create some fervor so that somehow their false deity would be able to see what was going on and have mercy on them and send a firestorm? And, and Elijah lets them go through that whole motion. Then Elijah soaks the altar with water, and then Elijah says, okay, Lord, please light it. Pshoom! right? I mean, all these prophets of Baal are there. I mean, the, the, I mean, we're talking high stakes. Is there really a Jehovah God who really, truly exists? And is this truly the divine sent one, Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one from God? To me, it all comes down to this, doesn't it? It all comes down to this. What is going to happen? Is it, is it going to be wishful intent? Listen, uh, it, you know what? Uh, I heal you in, in my name, and, and uh, well, you know, after two or three months, come on back here. I'll take another look at you. Uh, try, to, try to exercise those legs as much as possible. That is not what happens. Jesus says to him very simply, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And the Bible says in verse 12, the result was he got up, immediately picked up the the bed that he was on, and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed. They, again, the word amazed, we learned it last week, it means literally to blow one's mind. They are looking at this going, okay, he's cast out demons, he's healing all these people. Now this, the paralytic was the acid test of it all, because this was an amazing, amazing healing. He couldn't walk in. He was desperate. He had great need. And yet God heals him miraculously. Wow. God does this miracle, and he demonstrates to all of us that he has died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. Are your sins forgiven today? Have you come to the cross? Have you been spiritually rescued from the consequences of your sin there's a lot of stuff that goes on in our lives and we tend to look at the outside and we say to ourselves the paralytic's greatest problem is his paralysis and it was not his greatest need was right here in his heart the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life has christ forgiven you of your sin Maybe you're just going through the motions, but know this. When God's word says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, we have proof that the miracles of Jesus Christ, like this one, demonstrate his ability to save us from our sin. Let's pray, shall we? You're here this morning, you're not sure about where you're going to spend your eternity. How important it is that that decision be made to trust Jesus Christ and trust him alone. You're here this morning and you're not sure. There are folks here at the front who would love to have a word of prayer with you or point out more scriptures that might help answer some of the questions that you have. The Bible tells us these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Can you say that you know that you have eternal life today? Let's all stand as we pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. May we, Lord, each one of us stop and examine our own heart today to determine if our sins have truly been forgiven, for this is our greatest need. Work in our hearts today, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Don't forget about the ABFs. If you haven't joined an ABF to check it out. We have four of them going on. Let me encourage you to dive in one today. It's a rainy, yucky day. You don't have to go home and mow the lawn, okay? You really don't. The other announcement is that I will be meeting with those who are helping uh, with the uh, Uncharted Waters, UW Sports Ministry that's coming up in a month. 
And so if you are interested in helping, you didn't sign up or anything, please join me in five minutes in the conference room, grab a cup of coffee. We want to go through some uh, important things there. So very important meeting uh, for that today. So check that out. Also want to just uh, mention that uh, we want to welcome uh, Brian and Laura uh, Schowler as new members here. Raise your hand, Brian. I was going to have you stand up, but you're already standing. All right, welcome. And we have more people in the pipeline who are, are planning to, to join Faith Community Church as well. If you're interested, there's applications there, I believe, on the back table on your way out. Pick one up. All right. God bless you. Have a great rest of the day.